Take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. Y'all excited? The more excited you are, the longer I preach. Praise the Lord. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're in this impromptu series. I, I really never thought that this would turn into a series. Somebody say, He brings the ingredients. It started out, it was just going to be just one week, just, just a one week, one off message. We'd move into a series, but yet God had a plan. Has this series been a blessing to you? If not anybody else, it's been a blessing to me, Richard. We started off looking at this miracle of Jesus at the wedding of Cana. I believe, my personal opinion, the most powerful miracle of all. Why? Because he turns water into wine. I want you to think about this with me for a moment. He turns water into wine. He doesn't multiply the wine that is already there. He takes something that is not, calls it something that it is, and it becomes that something without having the ingredient of grapes. In other words, when Jesus declares something over your life, he has the ability to bring the ingredients that are needed to make you the person that he called you to be. And here's what's cool about it. All of those ingredients may not be present in the moment, but he has a way of sprinkling them into your life when you get to the place where you need them most. And then the second week, we looked at Peter, who was walking into the temple at the gate called Beautiful. And this lame dude was like, alms for the poor. And Peter said, hey, man, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, I give to you. It's the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. Somebody say, use his name. And then the next week, it was blind Bartimaeus who found out Jesus was close by him. And he started shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody else said, hey, you need to be quiet. You're not reverent enough. You're too loud. You need to be quiet. Shut up. And he said, what? The Bible said he shouted all the more. Somebody say, shout more. And then last week, thank you. And then last week, Jesus was cool, man. He was just as cool as the other side of the pillow. He's sleeping on the cushion in a boat, traveling across the Sea of Galilee, the wind and the waves. <laughs> Blew up and, and the disciples went to Jesus and said, don't you care if we drown? He stood up and he said, peace, be still. And the... <laughs> The wind died down. Somebody this past week said, man, all of your sound effects last week, man, we, you know, we could have done without them. So today I'm doing them all the more. I hope that person's here. Praise the Lord Jesus. I'm just, I'm just saying. So I want to, I want to pick up with another story, Mike, about the Sea of Galilee. But more than that, we ended on this thought, this concept that I want to pick up with. The concept was... Jesus will not send you with a word without also sending you with his presence. Did you hear me? Jesus will not send you with a word without sending you with his presence. So I want to look at how the Holy Spirit helps us apply the word that has been spoken over us. So can we read a few verses? I'm just going to read a couple of verses. It's not many today. And then you're going to be able to be seated. So let's pick it up in verse 16. It says this, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum, which is home, by the way. By now, it was dark. and Jesus had not yet joined them. Verse 18, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, which is approximately halfway, they saw Jesus approaching and they were frightened. Hmm. Verse 18, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. But Jesus told us to go this way. Now 
the water starts passing over the bow of the boat. But Jesus told us to go this way. The wind of relational difficulty, the wind of insecurity, the wind of problems, the wind of lack, the wind. But Jesus told us to go this way. They rode halfway across, couldn't go any further. They had been doing this for hours, rowing and rowing and rowing. You know they hit the point of frustration. Does anybody do good with frustration? It's anybody at your best when you're most frustrated. Anybody in here? I, I'm talking about a lot of frustration. I'm not talking about all the telephone calls you get on your phone about your car warranty expiring. <laughs> I'm talking about like you are in between what God did and what God said. You're in between what you've seen God do and where he said to go. And you can't get any further. You can't move any further. You can't grab any traction. You can't do what it is that he told you to do. You can't go where it is that he told you to go. And it seems like the more and more you try, the more and more you're stuck, the more and more you're frustrated, the more and more you're overwhelmed. And you know that the disciples had to be a little bit confused because here they are doing what Jesus said to do. And Jesus has done some incredible stuff. He's done some incredible things. He's just finished preaching to the multitudes. The Bible says that many were healed. He, people brought the sick to Jesus and many were healed. And then all of a sudden they got hungry because the revival meeting went too long. And Jesus, and Jesus at this moment, Ronnie, somebody says, they're hungry, Jesus. He says, well, we're going to feed them. And they're like, oh, man, you nuts. There's not enough John, Long John Silvers around here. So he goes and he gets this lunch box and they bring it back to Jesus and Jesus blesses it and he feeds the 20,000 people and everybody's like fed and everybody's like, you know, everything's good and Jesus has just done this miracle. Now the disciples, John's gospel tells us it's that same day they get back in the boat to go to the other side and <sighs> confused and overwhelmed. They're in between what God did and what God said they're rowing but they're not going anybody in here feel like you're rowing but you're not going you know what I'm saying I'm making rhymes and dropping dimes come on now you, you need to hear me like you're trying but it just it's not working you, you, you're going but you're not going anywhere you're trying to get it done but you're not getting anything done and, and you may learn like uh, who God was and what God said and, 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 and even what God did but you're not experiencing what you saw God do for somebody else and you kind of are like in the middle you ready for the title when you get to a place it says they rode they rode about three or four miles it hit me you may not be able to figure things out, but you got to do what you can while you're waiting on God's plan. So you need to look at your neighbor and give him the title. I'm working on something. Look at another neighbor and say, I'm working on something. Look at another neighbor and say, I'm working on something. Online, say, I'm working on something. I, I need somebody. You've come to this place today. Let me tell you something. God is about to place something inside of your spirit. You've got to change your mindset, though. You may not be where you want to be, but you've got to say, I'm working on something. It may not be going as fast as you thought it would, but I'm working on something. Others may have told you that you'll never get there, but I'm working on something. You've even told yourself that you'll never get to the other side, but I'm working on something high five your neighbor and say I'm working on something now you can sit down I knew today's word was going to be for somebody really really somebody because yesterday I was here working on my message kind of changing some things around I came out of my office and Donna who's 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 the leader of our life coaches who's doing an incredible job 
Donna, who, who was standing in the coffee shop, she's, she's praying, her and Brian, about a situation in their lives that they just need God to show up. They just need him to show up. You know what I'm saying? You ever been there? You just need God to show up. And she said, uh, and it's a good situation. It's going to be a great situation. It's going to be an awesome opportunity. I know, but, but she's like, I'm just doing something. You know, I'm just doing what I can. I'm just working on something. And I said, hold on a second. I'm thinking to myself, we haven't sent the text out yet that we send you on Saturday night that normally gives you my sermon title. <sighs> Hoping that we'll just put the hook in you and bring you to church. <sighs> it hadn't gone out yet. So I said, hold on. You know what? You know what my message title is tomorrow? She said, probably something like what I've just been talking about. I said, no, exactly what you've been talking about. The title of my message is I'm working on something. Huh. So let me, let me work on something with you this morning. Can we do that? So in John chapter 6, verse 16, it says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake. John in his gospel is articulating for us a specific time. He's letting us know that darkness is approaching when evening came. But the significance, Richie, of that particular verse is to also connect you to what Jesus had just done earlier. What Jesus had done earlier, and I know that I'm doing something impromptu, and we didn't do this in the first service, so production team just hang with me. Jesus had just done one of the most talked about miracles that all of us know where he took the, the lunch box of the boy and he blessed it and he was able to take five loaves and two fish and feed upwards of 20,000 people. And, and the Bible says that everyone was satisfied. He's just finished this. He's just finished doing this. This is incredible. But then right after he does this, he gives a directive to the disciples. Put verse 12 up for me. You're ahead of me. It says this. It says, when they had all had enough to eat, not just an appetizer, not just like just, just barely enough just to wet their, their, their morsel. This was like he, they all had enough to eat. He said to the disciples, gather up the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Verse 13, so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets. How many baskets? How many baskets? With the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had, who had eaten. How many baskets full? How many disciples? So in this moment, they walk down to the seashore, standing where the boat is. Each disciple is carrying a basket. Each disciple is carrying a basket. There's 12 disciples. Let me take some liberty with the text because I have to live inside the text. I have to imagine how this thing rolled out. They're all standing down at the seashore and they're like, man, I can't believe what Jesus did. Can you believe what Jesus did? That's incredible what Jesus did. And look at all these leftovers. What are we going to do with all these leftovers? This is powerful. This is incredible. Yeah. And then all of a sudden somebody said, well, what are we, we going to do now? And somebody way back in the back said, well, you know, Jesus said we need to go to the other side. Well, then let's get in the boat and we'll go to the other side. So they get into the boat and they're going to go to the other side. And you know they're celebrating. They're like celebrating what, what, what just happened. It's like, oh, this is incredible. And they got all 12 baskets. And all of a sudden, you know, they realize in verse 17, it says that Jesus is not with them. Where they got into the boat and set off across to the lake to Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. So Jesus isn't with them, so you know they're talking about Jesus, probably a couple of things about Jesus. They're probably saying, man, this is absolutely incredible. Where's Jesus at? Where did Jesus go? What is Jesus doing? And then probably Andrew said to Peter, said, Peter, man, did you witness this? I'm just blown away by all this stuff. And Peter was like, I sure did. <laughs> I did. I just got some of this bread. Mm. I'm talking, you're scrumptious. 
I'm talking this bread is wonder bread. Wonder bread. You hear me? That wonder bread you buy in the store, that's heaven's bread. You know, just. But then all of a sudden, something they were not expecting because they're doing what Jesus said to do. And while they're doing what Jesus said to do, they're not expecting a, a storm. They're not expecting a problem. They're not expecting a difficulty. They've just seen Jesus provide, and now they need Jesus to provide. And they're stuck in between what Jesus did and what Jesus said. Like, we know what he did, and what he did is incredible, but we need him to do something now. I mean, we've rode, guys. We've rode, and we've rode, and we've rode, and we can't get there. We need him to do something now. I, I don't know who's in this position, but you, you, you feel like you're out of place. You feel like you're overwhelmed. You feel like you can't get there. You're, you're asking yourself the question, when is this supposed to happen? When am I, how much longer can I do this? How, how much more can I take? Did I mess it up too much where Jesus isn't going to show up? Is this problem too much for me? Have I gone too far in the wrong direction? When will this addiction, when will I get past this? pain when will I become more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus and there you are just trying to make it let me speak to you theologically for a moment because if you were to evaluate this this story according to Mark's gospel and and even Matthew's gospel You'll notice that in their gospel, Jesus actually tells them to get into the boat and to go to the other side. Now, here's what's amazing to me. It's the timing of this miracle because just a few days before, they were going to where they're at now. And on their way, Jesus was asleep in the stern of the boat. And when the storm got to be too much, Jesus stood up and said, peace, be still. But now they're going back and they encounter a storm. But guess what? Jesus is not with them. Jesus is always teaching the disciples something. Why? Because Jesus wants them to become what he's declared over their lives. So we have to think in the back of our minds that this is a lesson that Jesus is teaching them. He's actually bringing another ingredient. Some gospels even say that this, this experience for the disciples was very frustrating, that they were at their wits' end, that they were frustrated, that there was no gain, that no progress. They just kept fighting the wind and the waves. One historian said that most likely they had been fighting this for about eight hours. For eight hours thinking we're going to die. For eight hours trying to live the plan that Jesus placed over their lives. For eight hours trying to walk in the will of the Lord. But for eight hours they're questioning the timing of Jesus. Why now? Why this? You know, thinking about timing is... is why is it that things always happen at the most inopportune time? Like this week, you, you, you have something that happens, or last week you have something that happens. And, and, and had it happened the week before when you had plenty of time, it had been all right. But it doesn't happen then, you know what I'm saying? And so you're in this place where I'm frustrated, you don't know what to do. What, what, what do I do? What, what do I do? What, 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 what do I do? Well, I noticed that it says they rode. It doesn't say they stopped. It says they rode. If you want to get through something, you got to keep doing something. Hold on a second. You got to keep telling yourself this word is 
going to happen. You got to keep fueling your faith. You got to keep speaking over, over your life. You got to keep taking the word that God said and, and, and work it into your life. You got to do what you can while you're waiting on his plan. You cannot allow the frustration in your life to sideline you. You see, you may not have everything you need in the moment, but you got to start telling yourself, but I'm working on something. I, I may not have all the money that I need right now, but I'm working on something. I, I, I'm going to college and I'm trying to get a degree and I'm living off of beanie weenies, but I'm working on something. You're in the gym and you're working out and you got a belly. You just tell yourself, I'm working on something. You know what I'm saying? You can't go on vacation right now, but I'm working on something. I may have to study a little bit more than he does to be the success that he is, but what I know is that I'm working on something. I don't know who needs to understand and hear this, but you might not be able to figure it out. You might not know how to get out, but I'm here to tell you that if you'll just hold on and continue to work on something, when you begin to work on something, you'll always go through a season of frustration. And when you go through that season of frustration, if you'll just hold on, you need to understand that victory is just around the corner. Let me tell you something. There's people in this place. Don't you dare give up on your dream. Don't you quit. Don't you think about it for a minute. You may not have the family support. You may not have the financial support. You may not have the wherewithal right now in this moment, but don't you quit. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. Don't you quit. You just say, I'm working on something. You may want to give up on a relationship. You may want to give up on a job. You may be frustrated. and You may feel like you don't have any peace. Can, can I tell you something? It is not the wind and the waves that robbed you of your peace. It's that you have allowed the effects of the wind and the waves to rob you of your peace. You've allowed the You've allowed the wind and the waves to rob you of your peace. You've been frustrated and you're wondering, you're like, well, hold on a second. I, all I'm doing is trying to live the will of God. And you're frustrated with trying to live the will of God. You're frustrated with the timing of things. It's one thing. Let me just be honest with you. It's, it's, it's one thing to question the timing of Jesus if you're standing on the shore. It's a whole nother thing to question the timing of Jesus if you're in the storm and you don't have much time. It's one thing to come to church and get a word. You get a word and you get it down in your spirit, but then you got to go and deal with crazy on the job on Monday. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing to have to deal with crazy on the job, but it's a whole nother thing to bump into the crazy at your house. And you're trying and you're trying to go and you're trying to do and you're, you're trying to be, and you're, 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 you're trying, and, but you feel like you're stuck. You're not moving forward. You're not moving back. You're rowing, but you're not going. You're trying to get there, but you're not moving. Anybody ever been there? Like, you don't know whether <laughs> you're halfway. Like, do I turn around and go back where I came from, or do I go there? I gave this impromptu illustration in the first service. Probably shouldn't have because y'all are going to question my parenting. But, but several years ago, our middle child, Cody, who is now 28, so this would be many years ago. He was about maybe 13. I used to try, try to play tricks on my kids. You know, I'm a practical jokester. All you got to do is ask the staff. And so I would do this thing with my kids to where they would try to get in and I would try to see how fast they are. You know, I'd hit the unlock button, and unlock button, unlock. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you know, just nutty stuff, you know. So this one particular night, we're at a restaurant, Brian, and I thought I'd add a wrinkle to this thing. So I'm So I put it and dry, and I just eased up a little like I was going to leave him. Well, when I eased up a little, my, my truck on the left side eased up a little bit. So I thought, what, what's that? And so I looked back out the window, and he's going. <laughs> my truck tire is sitting on his foot. Y'all don't have to make me feel worse than I already feel. Come on, man. What's wrong with y'all, man? Good Lord. Good Lord. Gee, Jesus forgave me. Why can't y'all? I mean, <sighs> but in that moment, I didn't know which way to go. Do I go forward and do I finish the process? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Darren? Or do I back up? I made an executive decision. I put it in park and got out of the car to figure out which way I needed to go. <laughs> Needless to say, you know, we got him home. Everything was fine. It was all good. His foot didn't get broke. Lord have mercy. I don't know how, but I never lived it down. You ran over my foot, Dad. <laughs> but sometimes... We get in that place, and we just we don't know whether to go forward or back, forward or back. Do I move forward? Do I go back? What, what do I do? But sometimes I think we lose our peace in the middle of frustration, but sometimes I think it's the loss of our peace and our frustration is self-induced. Like, I, I think Thomas is, like, saying to Peter when they're on the boat, he's probably like, I'm going to just keep it 100, Peter. I thought you were a fisherman. I thought you could get us out of this mess. I'm just keeping it 100. You know how you get those curt text messages and they end with the 100? And you're like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You keep it 100 in your life in every single area and watch what you destroy. You keep it 100 in every single area. I'm going to just keep it 100, okay? You go to work tomorrow and you keep it 100. You walk in and you tell everybody at work, I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like none of y'all. None of y'all are as good at this job as I am. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. And Billy, your breath is the worst breath I have ever smelled in all my life. And I don't like this place and I don't want to be here and I'm better than you and I'm just keeping it 100. You keep it 100 when your wife asks you, do these jeans make my hips look big? You keep it 100 and you see what happens. <laughs> you keep it 100 when you walk up to somebody and you're like, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind politically speaking. I'm going to keep it 100. And you tell them you're an idiot. And yet, listen, you're just dumb. I can't believe that you even believe that. Keep it 100 and see what happens. You see, some of you are frustrated and, 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 and you're, you've lost your peace and, and it's self-induced because you're constantly beating other people up and you're keeping it 100, but you ain't keeping it 100 with yourself. You're kind of quiet up in God's house. Let me move on before y'all get riled up here. Let me take you somewhere. John chapter 6, verse 19. John chapter 6, verse 19. I'm going to close a little different, so my teams hang with me. Come whenever you get here. Just It says, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. Here comes Jesus, and they're frightened. One gospel says that they thought Jesus was a ghost. It's a ghost! I had this thought about the story. Why were they frightened? And then I came to this realization that maybe they were not ready for supernatural intervention. No, 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 that's a bad word. Not that they were not ready for supernatural intervention. They just didn't expect supernatural intervention. 
And the timing of this miracle blows me away because just the, five, the, the previous Tuesday, I mean, it's just a few days, just the previous Tuesday, you know, Jesus was on the same body of water with them and he calmed the sea. Just hours before this, Debbie, the, he, he's fed the thousands and there's 12 baskets full of reminders of the blessing of God. But yet now they've rowed halfway and they don't feel like they can go any further and they're not sure what's going to happen. They're rowing against the wind. They're just sitting there. Move. Somebody in this place, you feel like you're not going anywhere. Somebody in this place, others have told you that you will never go anywhere. But then it hit me. They never stopped rowing. You see, you got to do what you can while God, while you're waiting on God's plan. I got, I got you. You, you got to have it this way. Listen, even in those frustrating times, you got to work on something that brings God glory. Did you hear me? You got to work on something that brings God's glory, even in those frustrating times. But Pastor Mar, you don't understand. I, when's this depression going to leave? When's this, this feeling of insecurity going to leave? When, when, when am I going to get over this? Why, how much longer does this have to happen? How, how much longer do I have to go through the... How much longer do I have to put up with this? Here's what I need you to understand something. You may not think that Jesus is near, but Jesus is near. And Jesus is looking for you. And when you ask Jesus to come into the boat, this is the thing that you need to understand. When you ask Jesus to come into the boat, resurrection gets in the boat. Peace gets in the boat. His grace, his incomparable riches get in the boat. His mercy gets in the boat. His breakthrough gets in the boat. His overwhelming power gets in the boat. His anointing gets poured out on you in the boat. Come on, somebody. I need some help up in here. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I'm working on something. Verse 20. Verse 20 says, But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Ronnie, at first glance, it looks as if he's speaking to their fear. And in a way, he is. But he says something more here in just three words It is I. It is I. It is I. It is I. It's me. It's Jesus. It's the same Jesus that last Tuesday I spoke peace be still over this wind and this wave. I, I just fed 20,000 people and the reminder is all around you. It is I. It is I who brought you this far. It is I who will get you to the other side. It is I. What I need you to understand is some of you need to take your minds back to a place where you saw Jesus do his last miracle and remember what he did. Have that childlike faith and look around and believe what he can do. And then you need to pick up that oar and you need to begin to row. You got to work on something. You got to work on something while you're waiting on him. You got to work on something. You got to wait on him. You got to praise him you gotta thank him you gotta give glory to him you gotta believe in him you gotta hold on to him you gotta water that word I'm working on something I'm working on something everybody on your feet let me read this last verse then they were willing take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading hold on a second it does not say the wind stopped John's gospel and again I'm just reading into this but I'm telling the story so let me John's gospel is very, very articulate. He tells us a lot of stuff. He gives us a lot of details. He does not say the wind stopped. He says that they immediately made it to the other side. In other words, Jesus 
did what they couldn't do. But hold on. They did what they could do. And he did what they couldn't do. They did what they could do. He did what they couldn't do. He's still not getting it. They did work on something. And they might not have been able to get there on their own. But Jesus took them to the other side in such a way they couldn't take credit for it. Hold on a second. Jesus blessed their rowing. Did you grab that? He blessed their rowing. It says that they immediately made it to the other side. But first he said, it is I. When we understand that it's Jesus, when we understand that he makes a way where there seems to be no way, when we understand it is I, he is our peace. He is my breakthrough. He is my deliverer. He is my salvation. He is my second chance. He is my healer. He is all. I need somebody to help me. He is my joy. He's the one who will help me get to the other side. And while I'm waiting on the Lord, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to work on something. 